Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the, uh, brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. I'm very pleased to present to you this morning our brother Denny Petrillo. Denny is a well-educated man and a very sound, stalwart gospel preacher. He is president of the Bear Valley Bible Institute of Denver. He was a student there, as he mentioned in Bible class, and also attended York College, Harding University, and Harding University Graduate School of Religion, earning the AA, the BA, and the MA degrees, and he received his PhD in religious education from the University of Nebraska. He holds lots of gospel meetings in our country and others and has done a lot of teaching in some of the satellite schools in different countries including Germany, Spain, Panama, Argentina, Africa, and the Ukraine. He has taught at Magnolia Bible College, York College, and also the Bear Valley Bible Institute. We use his commentaries for some of our textbooks in our classes, particularly the one on Ezekiel, and I'm very pleased to present to you Denny at this time. In Little League Baseball in Denver during the summer, something very unusual happened. 11-year-old boy's team by the name of Vincent scored 26 runs in the top of the first inning without recording a single out. And in Little League Baseball, they have a time limit and they have a 10-run rule. And so the coach of the Vincent team called timeout and went to have a conference with the home plate umpire. And he motioned for the coach of the other team that was down by 26 runs to join him at this meeting. And after a brief conference, the coach of the Vincent team went ahead and motioned to his players to go take their respective positions in the field, even though they hadn't made an out yet. And the coach of the other team motioned for his boys to come on in. They were going to get a chance to have an at bat before time ran out. The very first 11-year-old boy looked like he had Down syndrome, but he was given all that he had to give, and the very first pitch just barely grazed his arm, and the umpire awarded him first base. The second batter fouled off a couple of pitches, but he was walked. The third batter also (coughs) fouled off a couple of pitches, and he too was walked, sending the young man that had Down syndrome to third base. The fourth batter to come up to the plate was one that took several big swings but fouled off a couple of pitches. But as it turned out, he too was walked. That meant that the young man that had Down syndrome on third base was going to be able to score a run for his team. And as he came down that third baseline, he stomped both feet on home plate and he had a smile from ear to ear. Well, there was a newspaper reporter whose son was actually playing in that game, and after the time had expired, just a few minutes later, wanted to make his way down to get the thoughts of the home plate umpire. And the home plate umpire said, you know, I've been umpiring Little League Baseball for almost 40 years. And in all of those 40 years, I have never seen a coach like this Vincent coach that really cared about the feelings of the other team. He really understands the point of Little League Baseball. As I was reading that in the morning paper, I couldn't help but think I've been an athlete all my life. I've coached, I've been a soccer referee for 26 years. 
When he said, gets the point of Little League Baseball, I understood exactly what he was talking about. Because we live in a society that we want to stomp them, we want to kill them. It's a dog-eat-dog, and there's hardly any sensitivity toward the feelings of the other team. But this Vincent coach really got it. And then as I was contemplating that particular statement, he really understands the point of Little League Baseball. I started thinking about the Bible. You know, the Bible is one that is filled with stories of people who got it and those who didn't get it. We read about, for example, Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus chapter 10, who were priests of God, sons of Aaron, and they, they took their respective fire pans and after putting incense in it, offered strange fire to the Lord such that he had not commanded them. And fire came down from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. What happened? Nadab and Abihu didn't get the point. They didn't get the point that when you come and you worship God, you give him what he wants. You give him what he asked for, but they didn't get that point. Later on in the Old Testament, we read about Achan in Joshua chapter 7. The Israelite army under the leadership of Joshua had just secured a great victory in the city of Jericho. Having marched around the city seven times for seven days and seven times on the seventh day and the wall fell down flat and they conquered, easily conquered this heavily fortified city. The very next battle was a battle against a little bitty town by the name of Ai. Actually, the Hebrew pronunciation would just be Ai. Because it was such a small place, Joshua dispatched 3,000 soldiers to go fight against the city of Ai. And the Israelite soldiers were easily defeated by the army of Ai. 36 men died in that battle from the Israelite army. Joshua falls down before the Lord and saying, God, what's going on? And God explained to Joshua that there was sin in the camp. And as they did the casting of lots, it came down to a particular Israelite soldier by the name of Achan. You see, Achan, when he went into the city of Jericho, apparently went into one of the homes there and saw some things that belonged to one of the, the uh, residents of Jericho, and he took those things. And he brought them back and hid them in his tent. You see, God had declared that everything in the city of Jericho was under the ban. Everything belonged to him. Now, we know that later on in the Old Testament, God had no problem with soldiers getting what we call the spoils of war, but not Jericho. You see, Jericho was the first city in the promised land. And just like the, the farmer offers the first <clears throat> of his crops, the rancher the first of his flock. Jericho was the first in the promised land, and it belonged to God. All of it belonged to God. And Achan missed the point. And as a result of his missing the point, 36 of his fellow soldiers died. And then later on, we read about King Saul and how King Saul was told to completely exterminate this people by the name of the Amalekites. And after the battle against the Amalekites... The prophet Samuel is walking up and King Saul says, Behold, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. And Samuel says, Really? Then what are these animal sounds that I'm hearing? You see, even the animals, even the animals were supposed to be killed. Nothing of the Amalekites was to be left alive. Samuel replies to Saul, Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice. Because Saul said, We've kept back some of the best to offer sacrifices to the Lord. He says, To obey is better than sacrifice. To heed than the fat of rams. You see, Saul missed the point. He missed the point of doing what it is that God wanted done. 
In that text that was read in Acts chapter 4, here we see some of the early Christians that really got it. They were willing to give up their homes and their property and sell those things and give the money to the apostles so they can be distributed to anybody that had need. They understood what was going on. They really did get it. And then we roll right into Acts chapter 5 and we read about Ananias and Sapphira. A husband and wife who just didn't get it. Brethren, the church is at a crossroads today. We're going to have to make some decisions as to whether we're going to be in tune with God's word or whether we're going to be like so many others that are so badly out of step. The Bible is full of people that toyed with religion and others who were somewhat religious, but this isn't what God wants. They're not getting the point. We have to be those that get it. We can't be modern day Nadab and Abihu's. Modern day Saul's, modern day Ananias and Sapphira's. We can't be like those people. If we're going to be Christians, let's get it right. Let's do it the way our God has asked us to live the Christian life. And to do this, we've got to remember some important truths. First of all, we have to remember that Christianity is not just following a set of rules. We're not just going through the motions. True Christianity affects everything that we are and do. It affects our work, work ethic, 1 Thessalonians 4.11. It affects the way that we are as husbands, as parents, Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. It affects our speech, Colossians 3.9. If we're getting it, we understand that Christianity impacts everything about me, everything about who I am. It's not like a time clock that we put in our hours and then we walk away from it. Christianity is not a nine to five. God forgive us if we ever get to the point where we come to church because, well, we have to. God forgive us if we ever get to the point where we say prayers at mealtime because, well, that's just what we do. And it's not out of genuine gratitude. We have to constantly remind ourselves to make sure that we're getting it. That we're understanding what is really going on. I understand this is a true story, Andy, about a man whose name was submitted to serve the congregation as an elder. And he gave a written reply to that request for him to serve as an elder. And this is what he wrote. I drink quite a bit and I love to dance. I am also inclined to gamble and my attendance is not what it should be. My Bible teaches me that elders should not do these things. Therefore, I'm going to let someone else serve as an elder and I will continue to be a faithful, humble, consecrated member of the church. You think somewhere along the line the guy might have missed the point? The cross calls us to do away with sin. The cross calls us to live Christianity 24-7. But we also, secondly, have to remember... That Christianity is not just one activity among many in our busy lives. You know, we have the tendency to kind of slot God in. You know, I, I've got this schedule. I've got to go to the store. I've got to fill the car with gas. I need to mow the lawn. I need to go to church. I need to... And somehow God is just <coughs> kind of slotted in. He's our Sunday morning time slot. When that happens, we're missing the point. Paul said, I'm crucified. With Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Christ lives in me. In the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's getting the point. I'm crucified with Christ. I'm alive, but my life is Christ's life to live now. That's getting it. Have you ever noticed in the first chapter of the book of Jonah 
that there's a repeated phrase, and that is that Jonah was trying to flee from the presence of the Lord. Ever notice that? God tells Jonah, I want you to get on a boat, and I want you to go preach to the people of Nineveh. Jonah doesn't want to go. So he gets on a, a, a boat, and he's going to southwest Spain, virtually the opposite direction, trying to flee from the presence of the Lord. And then, as the storm comes up, and everyone on the, the ship knows that they're certainly going to perish, as they're doing their inquiry, Jonah admits that he's the reason for all of this, because he's trying to flee from the presence of the Lord. And then as we go into chapter 2 of the book of Jonah, Jonah has been thrown overboard, and God appoints fish to swallow Jonah, and there's Jonah in the depths of the sea, in the belly of the fish, with weeds wrapped around him. Imagine the sound, imagine the smell, imagine the darkness. And there Jonah comes up to, comes to have a very important realization. You can't flee from the presence of the Lord. And so he prays. There he is in the depths of the sea and he prays to God. And God hears his prayer. Because Jonah recognized that you don't flee from the presence of the Lord. Like David in Psalm 139, we recognize that God is always with us. And we live like he is always with us. He is our life, not just a part of it. That's when we're getting the point. As I was a college professor for a number of years, I gave a survey to about 450 freshman and sophomore college students. It was a two-part survey about alcohol and about cheating. The part of the survey that was about cheating was this. I believe that cheating is, and then it was multiple choice, that cheating is always wrong, that it is uh, um, sometimes wrong, it is most of the time wrong, or it is never wrong. 1% of the 450 that took it said it was always okay to cheat. This is a Christian college. 15% said that it was okay to cheat some of the time. An additional 10% said that it was okay to cheat most of the time. That meant in my Bible classes at a Christian college, I had 26% that believed that at least some of the time they could cheat. Now, if you're staying with me this morning, those are college kids that grew up in the church that miss the point of Christianity. A relationship with God is more important than an A on a test in Bible. You would be better off to fail the test and maintain your integrity and your honesty with God. And as Tax season is about to come up. I'm telling you, I'm not going to cheat on my taxes in order to save a few dollars because that's missing the point of my relationship with God that calls me to be honest. If we're going to be Christians, let's get it right. Let's make sure that we understand that Christianity is our life, not just one activity in our life. And then third, we have to remember that Christianity is a religion of service, not of glory. Sometimes our earthly pursuits can blur our focus and we can get so sidetracked being caught up in the rat race and being caught up in with the busyness of our lives that we just don't understand that Christianity calls us to serve. Jesus said to the disciples in Matthew 20 when they had, uh, James and John had asked for the positions on Jesus' right and left. He chastises them all and says, it's not so among you, meaning you're, you're acting like Gentiles. 
Whoever wishes to become great shall be your servant. Whoever wishes to become first shall be your slave. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. You see, Jesus is teaching that now is the time to serve. You know, John 13 is an amazing chapter to me because as we are going to be focused on the Gospel of John in our lectureship, John makes the point in chapter 2 that Jesus knows man. and He does not need anybody to bear witness to him concerning man because he knows what is in man. Now take that point and then scroll forward to John chapter 13. Jesus girds himself with a towel and he is going around and he's washing the, def- the feet of all of the disciples. And Jesus knows this one is going to flee from me in a few hours. This one is going to betray me in a few hours. This one is going to deny me, not once, not twice, but three times in the next couple of hours. But he kept washing. He kept washing their feet. Does that amaze you? But you see, Jesus served because not the worthiness of the person that's being served but because he came to serve, and servants serve. Now, I don't know all that much about this congregation, but I'll bet there's work that needs to be done here. And I will will take a wild stab that there are some things that there are not enough people involved in order to get the work done that needs to be done. And sometimes this is an illustration of where we miss the point. Because we're supposed to see Christianity as a religion of service. And all of these other things can become such a primary part of our lives that we just don't have time for God. We don't have time to serve. We don't have time to teach Bible classes. We don't have time to come on men's work day. We don't have time to do this or do that. And we're missing the point. Turn in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. <clears throat> I love this section where Paul is, he's being brutally honest because Paul, if he had his choice, would die. He's in prison when he writes this epistle, <clears throat> and his preference would be to die. Because he says in Philippians 1 verse 21, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet I, yet what uh, I shall choose, I what not. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, To abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy in the faith. All right, so if we boil this down, what is Paul saying? Choice of mine is to die and go be with Christ. Far better. But if I am going to live on in the flesh, I'm going to serve you. That's the way it's going to be. You see, Paul got the point. That wasn't what he wanted, but that was what he was going to do if he was going to live on in the flesh. We've got to understand that Christianity is a religion of service. The glory is going to come, but that's going to be later. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 10. Talk about getting the point. These brethren in Hebrews 10, boy, they really got it. We'll start reading verse 32. But call to remembrance the former days, in which, after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great flight, a great fight of affliction, partly whilst you were made a gazing stock both of reproaches and afflictions, 
and partly while you became companions of them who were so used. For you had compassion of me and my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourself that you have in heaven a better and enduring substance. All right, as he's describing these Christians, they put themselves at risk for people that were in prison, even risking the potential that they themselves would be imprisoned. They were those that joyfully gave up the seizure of their property. You want my house? Take it. You want my possessions? They're yours. And he said there are two reasons why they had that perspective. First, they had an abiding possession in heaven that could never be taken away. And secondly, it was better anyway. It was better. Now, I live in a nice house, but it's nothing like eternity. I have some nice things, but they don't compare with what God has in store. You see, these Christians got it. They truly understood, and so they were willing to put themselves at risk because they understood the point. Brethren, so how about us? If the Bible was actually being recorded today, and there was going to be something written about you in the pages of God's Word, what would be said? What would be said? Would you be an example of someone that got it? It's someone that truly understood what Christianity was all about. And so your life is an illustration of dedication, of sacrifice, of service. Or, if the pages of God's word were being written today, would you be one of those that said, well, came on Sunday morning, but that was pretty much it. Not much else given to the church. No more time. No more energy. No more contribution to the work. Yet another illustration of somebody that just didn't get it. We have to make sure, as we think about our lives, that we're getting it right. Being what God wants us to be. In Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost... The first gospel sermon is preached. And Peter, when he concludes that sermon, says, Let all the house of Israel know for certain that this Jesus, whom you crucified, God has made him both Lord and Christ. And they were pricked to their heart, and they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. As we read on in Acts chapter 2, we find that there were 3,000 people that were baptized on that day. Now, if we wanted to frame it like we're talking about this morning, we could say that there are 3,000 people that got the point. 3,000 people that understood their own sin in their lives and what they needed to do in order to have a right relationship with God. They got the point. All 3,000 of them did. If Peter were preaching to us this morning, what would he say that we need to do? The exact same thing. The exact same message that was preached nearly 2,000 years ago would be preached today. Have you done that? Have you repented of your sins, having believed that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? Repented, confessed Jesus as Lord, and then been immersed in the waters of baptism? Because according to this text and many others, like Romans 6, 3, and 4, that's when you become united with Christ. That's when you are saved. If you haven't done that, you've missed the point. But you can do that this morning. Or it may be that you have done that, but you see that you've allowed the things of the world to uh, take away your, your life of service to God. And you would like to repent of that and ask for the, the prayers of the faithful men and brethren of this current, uh, uh, men and women of this congregation. We've got the front pews that have been left vacant 
is as we sing this song of encouragement, if there's any way that we can help you, please let us know as we stand and sing this song.